Perfect, we are all online. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So uh, welcome everyone, um, wherever you are in the world. My name is uh, Andrea Chmielinski bigazzi and I have the pleasure and the honor of being the coordinator of Privacy Rules together with um, other colleagues, uh, Daniel Sidoli present here included. Now, who we are, Privacy Rules um, is an alliance of uh, uh, global, um, initially legal experts, which was launched in 2018, evidently when the general data protection regulation was coming to the fore and there was the need of helping companies around the world with uh, an in interconnected tapestry of data protection legal experts, due obviously to the complexity, the growing complexity of data privacy regulations and related compliance. Uh, by now, our legal members cover 57 jurisdictions around the world, including all the strongest economies, and we continue growing. Um, when we started working, with, we, we realized that the best way to serve our clients is to create an environment for effective and efficient relations with carefully vetted cybersecurity experts, some of them are here today, and more recently also with data crisis communications specialists. Uh, this is, if you want, the uniqueness and the strength of privacy rules. Our alliance is growing globally with strong roots on three fundamental pillars that are our privacy leading legal, cybersecurity, and comms advisors. Now, today's webinar is dedicated to uh, insurance companies, evidently, and in particular, to those insurance companies that provide uh, cyber insurance coverage or are planning to do so. We want to present to you all our capabilities and offer our coordinated services, because actually we know your business. Our advisors present here already know and work with your peers in their respective countries. And we acknowledge that your industry and your clients are under tremendous pressure. Why that? Uh, I'll mention just two reasons primarily. The first is related to the fact that in, in the last two years only, the number of successful cyber attacks against insurance companies has increased dramatically. Uh, just to mention uh, the US market, for instance, it is estimated that attackers have penetrated um, a personal identifiable information of more than 100 million Americans through attacks to insurance companies. A second reason, possibly even more um, affecting the market, ransomware has become, if you want, a villain industry in and against the global economy. Insurance companies, are called to pay ransoms, but also actually to address the overall problem of ransomware payments. It's, a, it's an ethical problem, it's a social problem, it's, a, it's a, a governmental problem, if you want. So they find themselves in a difficult position of a business that is called to invent a quasi-public policy. And I perfectly know that all of you insurers present here today perfectly know what I'm talking about. Now, Due to these factors, we have decided to invite you today to, to this presentation with the purpose of introducing you um, to our global services as unique, integrated, and rapidly actionable solutions from, for your own companies, of course, and likewise for all your clients. Uh, we are going to present to you today our uh, cybersecurity partnership program who uh, has created a presentation in order to explain and to show how we can help solving your problems and the problems of your industry. Our experts today have a solid experience in serving insurance companies, as I said, in the respective markets. And thanks to privacy rules, they are upscaling their capabilities indeed at a global level. Shortly, you can discover our holistic and non-competitive cybersecurity ecosystem and how it can contribute to prevent and solve many of your pains. Our centralized expert coordination program represents an opportunity for cost minimization, time efficiency, multi-regional impact, trustworthiness through zero trust, and if you want also reputational advantage. We will also distribute some documents at the end of the presentation so they can be taken by you as a takeaways and possibly we can meet together one-on-one -on -one in, uh, in the next weeks in order to allow us explaining to your executives how we can save you money, time, administrative delays and bureaucracy, while at the same time increasing your public perception. Also, very important, in front of regulatory authorities. Now, for the moment, I just want to stop here. I welcome, welcome every one of you again, and I invite everyone in the audience to put questions through the Q&A button at the very end of this page. 
And I leave the floor to Daniel Sidoli, the, the project officer of our cybersecurity partnership program in order to introduce our excellent experts today. And thank you, Daniel, again, for having set up this panel for us today. Thank you. No problem. Thanks to you, Andrea, for the kind words. And uh, I, re I renew the warm, the warm welcome to our live audience and to our members, of course. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm in charge of the coordination of uh, two of the pillars Andrea referred to. Uh, one takes form uh, um, as the cybersecurity partnership program. So this alliance uh, uh, you're going to see uh, throughout uh, this, uh, this event. And the other one focuses on the communication and it's called the Comprehensive Cyber Crisis Communication Program or 4CP in short. Um, this event is divided in uh, three sections. So we're gonna have uh, an intro, uh, then a central part with uh, individual speeches and uh, um, a short Q&A section, uh, section for its conclusion. So in the intro, we're gonna have the two chairmen uh, of our cybersecurity partnership program speaking. Giovanni Silvestre from Wieslings Group uh, and Ken Morris uh, from Kinect IQ. And uh, as a legal uh, representative, uh, we're gonna have uh, Lindsay Wasser, uh, who is a partner at uh, Macmillan LLP, a Canadian law firm uh, specialized uh, in uh, privacy. Um, and also she's, uh, she's, the, she's the head of uh, the Privacy Rules Committee on uh, Data Breaches also uh, from, the, from the legal perspective. Then we have, um, we're gonna have uh, four individual speeches. And uh, unfortunately today, Gleb Capusto cannot join us, Gleb Capusto from First Bridge. So uh, we invite you, if you're interested in uh, smart contracts uh, and artificial intelligence uh, to reach out to us uh, through our contacts and uh, ask us, uh, then we will uh, reply individually. Um, after this section, we're going to have uh, a closing section um, with, uh, with a con concise Q&A. So we strongly invite you to, uh, to put your questions in the, in the appropriate uh, chat. And uh, we will see uh, whether we can answer them live uh, or we will uh, reply individually after this conference. So uh, having said that, thank you again for joining. And I will leave the floor to Giovanni. Thank you, Daniel. So depending on, uh, let me say, where you are in the world, first of all, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Giovanni Silvestre, and I have the pleasure of collaborating with Privacy Rules. I serve as a co-chairman of the uh, Cybersecurity Partnership Program, and I am going to share with you some slides I would like to spend just a couple of minutes explaining some trends, problems, and challenges of the cyber insurance ecosystem. So for sure, the potential of the cyber insurance business is very high, but it's also very risky. Nowadays, cyber insurance, as well as other types of insurance, are fundamental and are an essential part of our economic system because in case of incident, they often also represent a lifeline for companies, shareholders, as well as for their employees and the related families. There are worrisome trends in, uh, in cyber risk. Attacks are more sophisticated, are fast evolving and changing. Ransom demands are fast rising. De facto, cyber threats are very difficult to stop and awareness among businesses about the effect of a cyber attack on their operations is going. As a result, the demand uh, for cyber insurance is going too, increase uh, which basically represents a positive trend. But while demand is increasing, cyber claims growing in number and complexity and therefore there is another problem meeting a rapid spike in demand on a still maturing market and fast evolving risks could result in significant losses too um, much as companies turn to their insurer when they have a claim insurers may look to reinsurers for support and in the case of cyber insurers already see an estimated 50% of the premium they collect to the reinsurance market. In recent years, 
cyber insurers also applied a considerable increase in prices. Despite this, there may just not be enough money in the still emerging business to cover all the needs. This scenario could ultimately lead to shortages in capital and reduced availability in the market for cyber insurance offers or to strong limitation in terms of coverage or to additional increase in prices. To avoid these problems, the high levels of risk sustained by insurers must be reduced. So cyber insurance and policyholders both have a problem. What can they do? How can they reduce this, the, the cyber risk? Simply playing their roles. What is not a cyber insurance? Cyber insurance is not a fully a full cyber risk protection. Cyber insurance will not instantly solve all cyber risk issues. Um, it will not prevent cyber attack and it will not protect against any risk. There are several problems and costs the cyber insurance policy may not cover, like for example, third party mistakes, sales loss during downtime, reputation damages, and so on. So what is cyber insurance? The cyber insurance is an additional protection which enables the business to call upon the insurer in the moment of need to cope with incidents that despite prevention, the company has not been able to avoid and which unfortunately, as, as we see every day, can paralyze a company, which if not helped, could also risk bankruptcy. Let's take an example. I am a cyclist and I have legal health and accident insurance coverage. But that doesn't mean I don't need a good helmet too. This doesn't mean that if a tire is worn, I don't have to replace it, or that if my brakes aren't working well, I don't have to fix them. Also because if I don't wear a helmet and I have an accident, there is a high probability I will seriously hurt myself. And then even best care and treatments will not be able to save me. So cyber insurance, can be very helpful and fill the gap when an unexpected security incident occurs. But prevent incidents is crucial and therefore companies need to protect their organization by ensuring they have the right cybersecurity safeguards in place. It's in the common interest to find the right balance between the prevention mechanism put in place by the company and the insurance coverage guaranteed by the insurer in order to reduce the overall, overall risk for both. Having said that, our suggestion for the insurers is to implement strategies that reward and encourage prevention by old as well as new potential customers. Companies should still invest in insurance company, in, in sorry, in insurance coverage, but also in prevention because prevention is better than cure and it's much cheaper too. So stay tuned, see you later. Great, thank you very much, Giovanni. And uh, now, Lindsay, can you, can you please give us a, a legal perspective on all of this? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So I'm Lindsay Wasser. I am head of the Privacy and Data Protection Group at Macmillan LLP, which is a Canadian full service business law firm. And we thought it would be helpful today for us to do a little bit of level setting when it comes to the life cycle of a breach and associated risks. So in general, we tend to think of breaches in three stages. First, there's a pre-breach stage, which is all about prevention. Then there's the breach itself, which tends to focus on containment, remediation, response, and reporting. And then finally, post-breach, which can involve dealing with residual impacts from the breach as well as learning and improving to reduce risks going forward. Now, it likely goes without saying that the pre-breach stage is the ideal point to mitigate risks. Now, the level of risk may not be the same for all types of organizations. It is relevant to consider the type of business or the sector that the organization operates in, because this is relevant to the type and amount of data that the organization processes, as well as likely relevant to the exposure of this data to the outside world and the attractiveness of the data to cyber criminals. 
For example, a B2B manufacturing business may hold minimal personal information and also likely transmits very little personal information online. On the other hand, a company that provides online healthcare services for a fee might be regularly receiving sensitive health and financial information over the internet. Now, the probability of attack and the severity of the impact on the organization is going to be quite different for these different types of businesses. But the gaps have narrowed over time as the risks have expanded, especially as mentioned with the rise of ransomware, because this reduces the focus of cyber criminals on the resale value of data. Pretty much any business is going to be hindered in its operation if it can't access its data or its electronic systems. So any type of business is vulnerable to cyber risk. Although the level of risk might vary, the risk mitigation measures tend to have a lot of commonality. Key factors are the organization's current level of cybersecurity and investment in technology, including core controls such as firewalls, malware protection software, appropriate patch management programs, strong authentication protocols, offline backups, intrusion detection systems, and implementation of access on a need to know and least privileges basis. Organizational awareness is also critical because it impacts both the likelihood that a cyber attack will succeed, as well as the average time before it's detected. It is common knowledge that the human element is a weak link in terms of vulnerability and phishing attacks, as well as weak credentials um, are still very common attack vectors. So this risk can be reduced with employee training, including ensuring that employees understand common sources and types of cyber attacks, how to detect the existence of attacks and the company's own procedures for what to do in the event that they suspect an incident. Finally, at the pre-breach stage, preparedness is an important factor. Having defined incident response uh, business continuity and disaster recovery plans can improve the effectiveness of the organization's response. This will in turn reduce downtime and costs, as I'll discuss further very shortly. From the perspective of the cyber insurance industry, the level of risk um, and key measures to reduce these risks are important considerations in determining whether to provide coverage as well as setting premiums. Insurers are in a position to ask questions and impose minimum standards for clients and can potentially also provide some assistance to help clients improve their defenses, such as basic training and resources, which can reduce claims. Despite the organization's best efforts, breaches can and often do still occur. At this stage, it's important to understand the types and costs, uh, the, uh, the types of the costs that can arise. This can include direct costs, as well as indirect costs and opportunity costs, including data loss, damage to hardware and software, intellectual property theft, legal and public relations costs, and costs associated with notifying individuals when there's a breach of personal information and providing credit monitoring where appropriate. The costs of, there's also costs in terms of business interruption and having to divert time and resources to containing the breach and remediating the effects. And again, as mentioned previously, there can be damages to reputation, customer relationships, and goodwill. Increasingly, there's also the potential risk of regulatory fines and penalties. Now, although Canada has not historically provided for GDPR level fines, we are heading in that direction. Very recently, Quebec has passed legislation, which is not yet in effect, but when it is, will provide for fines of up to $25 million or 4% of annual turnover, whichever is greater. And other jurisdictions in Canada are moving in the same direction. Again, understanding the risks and costs involved when a breach occurs is critical to the cyber insurance industry, as it's important to consider the scope and limits of coverage and to design products that are responsive to clients' needs. The faster that an organization detects and responds to a breach, the more it may be able to reduce direct costs, such as those associated with data loss, and the way that it handles the incident can significantly affect the level of reputational harm and impact to customer relations. 
even legal costs and damages can be reduced by an effective breach response. And a good example is a breach that occurred a number of years ago in Canada involving a company called Home Depot, which was ultimately settled. And in approving the settlement, the Ontario court noted, among other things, that Home Depot responded in a responsible, prompt, generous, and exemplary fashion. And in fact, the court would have approved a discontinuance of the proposed class action with or without legal costs and without any benefits to the class members. As it was, the judge awarded only $120,000 in damages to the plaintiff's counsel instead of the more than $400,000 that was being requested. And in discussing this issue of legal fees, the court noted that after the data breach was discovered, there was no cover up and Home Depot responded as a good corporate citizen to remedy the data breach. And so there was no reason to think that Home, De Home Depot needed or was deserving of behavior modification. So as you can appreciate, at the breach stage, it's beneficial for cyber insurers to have insight or oversight with respect to the company's response. And finally, we have the post-breach stage. Now, it may be too late at this stage to reduce risks and costs for the breach that already occurred, but this is the stage where the parties may be reviewing relevant insurance coverages and assessing whether adjustments are needed. And all parties can learn from the breach experience to adjust and reduce risks going forward. What's important to recognize at all three stages of the process is that a multidisciplinary perspective is essential to fully evaluate and reduce risks. Insurers and their clients need, need to consider the legal risks and requirements, but implementation of effective cybersecurity controls as well as breach investigation and remediation ultimately requires input from IT security and data forensics experts. And close collaboration with public relations is also necessary to ensure that the company is not only doing the right thing, but it's seen to be doing the right thing, which can impact the probability of litigation as well as reputational impact. A siloed approach reduces the effectiveness of an organization's breach response, which ultimately leads to increased costs and the potential for greater losses. Okay, thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, now we will give the floor to uh, Ken Morris, uh, who is uh, founder and CEO of uh, Kinect IQ to conclude uh, this, uh, this uh, initial introduction. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Lindsay and Giovanni, um, outstanding introduction to uh, at least set the scope of what we'll be talking about in more detail today. Um, the, uh, we'll be giving, uh, as each of the speakers goes through, uh, very specific and concrete tools uh, that will be available uh, to, uh, for consideration by industry to really think about how do I reduce uh, severity, how do I reduce risk, how do I understand the various exposures that are there. So without further ado, um, I will turn this to Giovanni uh, so we can dive into the specifics. Giovanni? Sorry, Ken. Or is Humphrey up? <laughs> Wrong plan. Yes, it's actually Humphrey. <laughs> All right, Humphrey, you're on. Oh, no worries. Uh, Humphrey uh, is uh, our international sales manager uh, at uh, Deep Secure by Force Point. Uh, they're based in the UK. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, customer, customer data, importing threat-proof content through digital transformation. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm just going to share my screen, if I may. Can everyone see okay? Yes. Perfect. So. Um, Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, to to just talk to you about uh, Deep Secure today. So I'm going to do three three things. I hope I hope um, introduce you to Deep Secure by Forcepoint, uh, talk about the problems with detection-based malware defenses, and introduce you to threat removal. So very quickly, Deep Secure are a um, basically a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, Forcepoint. We were acquired by Forcepoint in July um, uh, this year. Um, and uh, they uh, basically acquired us because we have some very exciting technology that can help with the sort of threats that uh, have been described earlier. So ransomware in particular um, being, being a, a key threat that we can help prevent in a, in a different way. Um, 
we, we've been around for quite a long time uh, uh, and uh, we had sort of core, core markets of defence, government uh, and critical national infrastructure, but uh, we are starting to, to work more and more in sort of financial services and financial organisations as well. And we have a, a, a range of technologies that um, can help you uh, protect content as it moves uh, uh, around uh, between uh, your organization and other organizations or even within your organization by doing some sort of policy enforcement. Uh, but what I was going to just introduce you to, to today uh, was our um, threat removal technology and how that um, is a different way to defeat the threat of malware uh, such as ransomware. So um, very briefly, just uh, we have, we have um, customers across sort of many vertical markets. Um, this is sort of deep secures customer base. Forcepoint has a, a vast customer base uh, around, around the, the globe, both in defense and government space, but also in the commercial space as well. So what, what's the problem we're trying to solve? So the, pro the problem is that um, uh, attackers are getting more and more sophisticated in the attacks that they perpetrate. And uh, they are finding it easier uh, and easier to breach traditional malware defenses um, to plant things like ransomware inside your, your organization. Um, and the sort of attacks we're talking about um, are things like zero day attacks. So they can, they can basically make an attack to order nowadays. Um, it's not, not that you, you sort of see a, a new attack every few seconds, they're actually writing attacks to attack you. And they're writing a particular attack to attack um, uh, in, in a phase of a, a campaign that they may have against you. So you might never see this attack more than once. So it's really hard to detect something that you haven't seen before. Um, uh, they might also be using sophisticated techniques like um, uh, steganography, where they're hiding the attack in something else. So your defenses might be looking to try and um, detect whether there's any malware in, a, in an image that's coming in, but actually, um, inside the image is hidden um, a, a piece of malware that, that is completely um, opaque to uh, anyone else um, look, looking at the image as, as an image, um, but impossible to, to detect. The way they're encoded, the information can be encoded within them in, in an image is really hard to detect. Um, and then things like polymorphic files. So you can have files that, that look like one thing, but actually if you, if you change the file type, it'll act like something else. So you can make a, 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 an innocent image uh, uh, run as a script. If you um, hide a script within an image and then uh, rename it as, a, as an HTML file, you can, you can run the script in, a, in an HTML application, like a browser. And the problem that industry is facing is that everyone um, is trying to detect the threat. So we've got a raft of technologies that have done that, and you'll all be familiar with these technologies. So things like antivirus, and uh, firewalls, next generation firewalls, um, things like sandboxing um, and, and sort of uh, using isolation as a technique to, to stop a threat are all trying to, to, to use um, uh, or subject to, to needing detection at some point um, in, in their uh, adoption. And so we, you know, we, we have a progression of technologies through you know, antivirus, sandboxing, and then things like machine learning, artificial intelligence that try and automate the detection process. So can we, can we use machines to, to, to detect um, for us and to prevent sort of new, new attacks? And the answer is you can to a certain extent, but all of these attack vectors have been compromised by uh, attackers who are just um, better and better resourced and have more incentive to bypass your detection-based defenses then we have time and resources to make our defenses perfect when we're, when we're using detection. It, and the reason for this is that all these sort of underlying applications that render the business information we want to receive are, are, are basically um, complex. And, and it's that complexity that attackers are exploiting. So they're finding flaws in the, in the, um, you know, the office um, programs or your PDF viewer um, and then they're exploiting those and crafting attacks to exploit those flaws that they found. So what we've, we've um, done is to come up with a new way to defeat um, the, the threat of malware without trying to detect it at all. And that sounds 
pretty um, impossible. Um, when I first heard someone say we're going to stop the threat without looking for it, I thought you you must be crazy. But um, actually, it's a really ingenious way and a really effective way to to stop the threat. Uh, and what we what we do is we we actually simplify the data. Um, so um, uh, what the, the, going back to the sort of first principles of security, if you have simple things then you can verify those, those simple things. If you try and verify a complex thing, it's really difficult to do that consistently and reliably. So what we actually do is if you want to send me something like a PDF file, I'm actually going to pull out the business information from that file. And by that, I mean, I'll sort of I'll pull out the text and the formatting information for the text and the pixel arrays from the images in the, in the text, uh, in, in, the, in the PDF file. And I'll write those out into a really simple data structure that I can then verify. And I can verify that that, that structure and the information that I pulled out can't contain anything that is malicious or executable. And if I'm happy, I'll actually build you a brand new PDF file and I'll populate it with the information that I pulled out. And in that process, by pulling out just the, the objects from the, from the PDF file that I know I can write out into a simple structure and verify, I can then leave behind all the carrying data that is, is um, where the attackers are actually hiding the, the malware that is, is compromising your systems. And we do this with everything. So we, we don't have the concept of saying, oh, well, some files are good and some files are bad. We, we start from the premise that everything is bad and that we're not going to let it into your organization unless we've been able to transform it in this way. And of course, there are exceptions to this, and you have to take a, a risk-based approach to, to some exceptions. So for example, we can't transform patches or binary files that you want to bring in for your to update your, your systems, but you need a different process for that. This is about giving users um, trustworthy data in real time or near real time um, that that you can guarantee is going to be threat free and and you now if you're trying to insure against the risk what you what you want is your the people you're insuring to have adopted technologies such as this that would uh ensure that that they're only going to allow information into their business that has um been uh transformed and can be shown to be uh threat free so you're taking away that element of doubt in, in where, uh, that you have in detection-based systems. Um, so I thought I'd maybe just give you a very quick demo. I know I've not got much time to, uh, to, to present, but if I may, I'll, I'll give you a, a very quick demo of, of what, we, what we do. Yeah. So yeah. Um, if you can have... complete just very briefly. Yeah, yes, very briefly it will be. Um, so I just have two, two um, windows here. What one is... Um, uh, showing a, 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 a little application that allows me to drop files um, in, into it, and it will it will pass the file to my transformation process, and it'll give you the, the the resulting file here. So the sort of file that we're talking about that might might be bad. Uh, I'm sure people have heard of the Emetet virus. So this Word document uh, that I'm going to show you, uh, you can see um, my antivirus thing says, "Oh look, there's something very nasty in this." in this file. Uh, in fact, normally when I do this demo, I turn it off, but I'm, I don't worry about that. I'll show you how what happens when I when I clean it and then try and open it again. So if I if I just put it through my transformation process, um, we can get the the clean file. And if I download the clean file, um, you can see that uh, I'm now able to open it and my antivirus isn't complaining, complaining that there's, there's something in it. And the threat removal process here has basically taken that Word file, pulled out all this information that you're seeing here, uh, left behind the executable that was hidden in the, in the file, uh, that was what my, uh, my antivirus was complaining about, and, um, and then rendered the, the file as a perfectly useful, editable, um, file to the to the user, but without the threat that was in there before. Great, thank you, thank you very much, Humphrey. And uh, it's definitely a very interesting approach to threat removal. And thank you also for showing us in uh, such a you know, concise time. Um, now I would give the floor to Giovanni Silvestre, 
who is Vice President uh, of Business Development and Sales at uh, Whistling's Group. Nice to meet you again. <laughs> I am back. So, Whistling's Group is an ethical, trustworthy, and vendor agnostic global cybersecurity provider on which companies can rely on to effectively protect their business and trade secrets against any form of cyber crime. We are headquartered in, in, in Switzerland since 1992. And as you can see in this slide, we have a global presence. The distribution of our branches allow us to be close uh, to our customers and to serve also multinational clients, providing local assistance and local language support. Witness Group is globally CREST uh, accredited as penetration testing provider, and our cybersecurity services are provided by highly skilled security professionals and penetration testers with long lasting experience in both defense and offense and holding the most recognized uh, certifications in the industry. We live and breathe cybersecurity is Wizlinks Group mantra. We have designed a service portfolio that covers the entire uh, risk management life cycle to ensure our customers benefit the most from our passion and experience, but primarily to maximize their protection with minimal effort required on the end. Complexity of the cyber risk is constantly evolving and fast rising due to budget constraints and to the high complexity of the actual ICT eco ecosystem, as well as due to the wide size of the attack surface and the continuous changes in terms of cyber risks, protect a company in a proper way, it's a big challenge. Once cyber attacks were frontal and a good network protection could give us a decent level of, of protection. But this is no longer the case because as we have seen in the previous slide, the complexity increases day by day and the attack vectors as well. Moreover, although we, we most often hear about big corporations falling victim to cyber attacks, Small businesses are the most vulnerable. Without big investments in technologies, the lack of IT staff and cyber specialists, small and medium enterprises are most likely to need help in identifying and managing the right security measures. That said, let me say, if the investments focuses on the real specific needs and security priorities of the company, even a limited budget can have a decisive effect in preventing cybersecurity incidents. And here, IT, IT audits and security assessments are fundamental because they represent in deep analysis able to identify the priorities and the path to be faced to optimize security without wasting energy, time, and money. In this slide, a non exhaustive list of our security assessments, which always include detailed reports and briefing regarding findings, intervention, priorities, and remediation. Moreover, thanks to our size, so Whitlinks is flexible enough to adapt and meet most customer requests. Our professional team, efficient uh, processes, and global distribution also allow us to handle high volume of concurrent engagement and provide when required 24 seven services. Some of our clients and partners are leading insurance companies to which we provide security services to meet their internal needs, as well as specific services related to their cyber insurance business. When we, we act as trusted cybersecurity partner of the insurer, we provide assistance to policyholders on behalf of the insurance company. At the beginning, 
The partnership agreements with insurers included our intervention only in the event of an incident. So for the incident response and recovery phase or for expertise or and advice, of course. But in the meantime, the number of incidents has grown exponentially in recent years, uh, which is why after, after a careful analysis of the situation, we proposed to our partners of the insurance industry to introduce more preventive measures. Our incident prevention and response mechanism is now based on these three pillars. First pillar is the risk evaluation and prevention activity, which apply in the insurance contract closing phase and consist in performing IT audits and security assessments in order to verify and improve the client's IT and cyber security posture. Second pillar is the incident response and recovery activity, which apply in case of incident and consist in supporting the policy order in order to respond and recover from a cybersecurity attack or data breach. Third pillar is the prevention of future incidents, which apply after the recovery phase and consist in performing security assessments and providing remediation consulting in order to avoid future incidents, because sometimes a cyber attack can hide nasty surprises and turn out to be the first of a long series. In this way, we have moved from a reactive approach to a proactive one in which prevention plays uh, a leading role. Proposals addressed to cyber insurance companies are perfectly tailored on their needs. We offer a wide range of service solutions, both in terms of service availability and service level, processes, processes and procedures, as well as uh, service availability, response times, and type of services will be personalized case by case based on the guarantees offered by the insurance company to the policy holders. Thank you for your attention. If you need any further assistance or have any questions related to our cybersecurity services, please don't hesitate to contact me. Wish you a nice day or a nice evening. All the best and stay tuned because my colleagues are going to present you very interesting solutions. Bye. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Okay, a very interesting uh, uh, set and comprehensive set of uh, services indeed. And um, okay, then uh, I will uh, pass the floor to uh, Leonardo Leoni, from, who is uh, an account manager at the uh, Innover Group and is gonna uh, tell you about phishing, all but effective, Analysis of fraud scenarios and countermeasures. Thank you, Leonardo. We cannot, okay, we cannot hear you. Sorry. Leonardo, I think you're still on mute. Yes. <laughs> and it doesn't unmute. Thank you, Zoom. In just a moment. Great. You can hear me now, right? Yes. Thanks. So thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Giovanni and Humphrey for your contribution. So let, first of all, let me present myself. My name is Leonardo Leoni, as Daniel was saying, my, saying I'm an account manager for the, the Innovery Group. Uh, Innovery Group is a multinational company established in Italy with his headquarter in Italy in 2001, specialized mostly in cybersecurity and successfully operating in many ICT environments, offering uh, system integration and services as well, services for uh, planning and creating a new solution. Among Innovary's customers, there are some of the most important uh, industry representative, uh, as well as financial, telecommunication, defense companies, and mostly, of course, uh, public, 
public administration offices and gaming and utility. So we, where we are, we are located uh, worldwide with the 11 offices and so that we can provide uh, rapid and flexible services around the, the globe. And most importantly, what we do, our job is to facilitate yours. Uh, our goal is to create a safer environment for our companies and mostly for uh, your company and for the customer's uh, personal data information. So Innovery is divided into business units and all are made of highly qualified and um, professionals. Uh, we vary from security managed services to data intelligence, e-business, networking and building system. Touching base also in the healthcare area and the smart uh, city projects. Um, so why we are here? Uh, as we all know, cyber criminals never take vacation. In fact, in 2020, uh, gave them the reason and renewed motivation to ramp up their nefarious efforts. So according to the US Federal Bureau of Investigation, phishing incidents nearly doubled uh, in frequency from 2019 to 2020. And overall, uh, phishing reigned you know, as the most common type of cyber crime last year. So, according to the idea that technology uh, can prevent all cyber related incidents, has never been farther from the truth. Because, of course, cyber criminals know that the easiest way uh, through uh, the easiest way in is uh, through humans. So, security leaders, of course, must understand that there is no such thing as a perfect foolproof, impenetrable, secure environment. Many organizations fall into the trap of trying to, to use technology as the only means of defending their network, and many times forget that the power of human awareness and intervention, that and intervention is a paramount in arriving in a highly secured state. And of course, also every security leader faces the same conundrum. Uh, even a, as they increase their investment uh, in sophisticated security orchestration, cyber crimes continues to rise. And security, in fact, is always uh, is often presented as a race between effective technology and clever attack me methodologies. So, according to the Verizon 2021 data breach investigation report, uh, phishing continues to be at the top the top threat action used against used in successful breaches. Cyber criminals stole login credentials in 85% of the breaches linked uh, to, to social engineering. And also in the second quarter of 2021, ATWG founding member OPSEC Security found that phishing attacks against financial institutions, in, in, which was also including uh, insurance institutions, were the still most prevalent, moving to 29.2% of all attacks and up from 22.5% of all attacks in the Q4 of uh, 2020. So, um, but how do we define phishing? Uh, for the, beside the, all the presentation and also the title of my presentation, which is old but effective, uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I decided to divide it, uh, the phishing threat into two different categories, company threats, in this case, phishing can be used uh, to attack every asset of a company, posing threat to classified information, trade secret, valuable company information, and also physical company assets, such as other infrastructure and sensors. And then from the other side, looking at the customer-based threat, we can say that phishing is the first vector into every customer's personal asset. Phishing can be used to steal personal information, financial information, such as bank account, and everything that we all uh, as, a, as security professionals are trying to protect every day. This graph extracted from internal data shows that the percentage of attack that we witnessed during the month of August for our financial customers. Uh, as you can see in the, in the graph, the ratio between attacks performed to the corporate environment, meaning uh, corporate accounts, uh, employees, 
account and the customer based attack is huge. So now in cyber criminals, of course, as the maturity level of many companies is growing, they are also changing target, meaning that it's way easier to target an attack, uh, distracted and always busy customer instead of now uh, employees which are technically or we sh should do uh, awareness exercises related to the to, to phishing. And in this case, uh, how do, do we as Innovery protect you against these threats? So of course at Innovery we understand that the protection against phishing is a top priority uh, for your companies. And we also understand that there is no definitive nor ultimate solution to tackle this phenomenon. Starting from this understanding, we develop a comprehensive and scalable service to help our customers, mostly financial, handle this phishing pandemic, as we like to define it. Uh, among our long, last, long list of uh, information technology services that we offer, our cybersecurity consultant practice bases the anti-phishing services on three pillars, as you can see. Readiness to respond. Uh, as the most important element uh, in phishing site uh, detection for a customer is not only the passive collection of data from various sources, but also the active search even before the phishing campaign is triggered. To do this, we monitor all the registered domain and SSL certificate issued and automatically check for phishing content when the brand resemblance to the customer is detected. The phishing hunting system knows where other, um, other phishing sites may have been hosting, hosted. And all these resources are, are also checked with uh, various methods to identify phishing attacks related to our customer's brand. Of course, there are also um, implemented in the, let's say, in the internet, email and mobile spam traps. And all links are tracked are tracked by these honeypots that are scanned for, for phishing. Um, going in parallel, there is also another uh, service. Thanks to our social media intelligence service, we monitor and oversee social media and online media to identify and report events and or threats uh, that may impact our customers uh, his, mm, and his brand and his approval rate. So this monitoring makes it possible to take targeted action uh, to protect its reputation and safety. Of course, our service allows our customer to monitor the brand and particularly relevant profile by simultaneously analyzing online content and social media and understanding the insight hidden behind conversational data. Many times um, uh, malicious uh, attackers try to first to communicate or publicize their attacks online. So it, it helps. Um, our services are governed by a lean and flexible organizational structure and a concrete and pragmatic approach based on the following principles. So we operate through work groups that combine strategic skills with highly qualified specific technical skills offer and develop solution consistent with the customer business model, and we operate quickly and effectively. Our consulting services aim to preserve the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information in the presence of threats through the adoption of organizational and technological measures, useful for safeguarding uh, the processes that manage corporate digital information. And how do we take this decisive actions? <coughs> Sorry. Uh, our strategic partners are members of several associations uh, which allows them to take down phishing site without involving the authorities, authorities or legal departments. The service, offer, uh, the service we offer monitors uh, millions of resources 24 seven and with a database of billions of domain names and official app stores and targeted contextual advertising and all popular social media. The service uses machine learning and uh, specified criteria to detect violations and mm, also uh, to detect brand abuse automatically. But to make sure that the legitimate resources are not blocked, uh, analysts will double check some of the pages. So to sum up, even though the phishing pandemic may be a long lasting issue, there are tools and services that companies like Novery and many other companies in this panel are willing to develop 
and customize uh, on the customer needs. So, and of course, we are here to guide you along this journey. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Leonardo, for your presentation. And also, if I may, congratulations for the uh, selection for photos for your slides, <laughs> which are very nice. I really enjoyed. And now I will give the floor for the for the concluding speech to um, concluding individual speech to Kenneth Morris, uh, who, as I said earlier, is founder and CEO at Kinect IQ, and uh, he's going to tell us about uh, understanding breach risk, cyber strategies, and tools to reduce frequency and severity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Alessandro, if you could bring up the slides. And by the way, um, everyone that has spoken before, thank you for the, the content. Um, it is specific, it's helpful. And um, what we're gonna do now is talk a little bit about certainly the industry. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but we'll begin focusing really on what does the cyber, cyber market look like? And how does cybersecurity tools, technologies really help focus to understand exposures and reduce the risk associated with that. Because at the end of the day, we need a healthy cyber insurance market uh, that serves not only insurers well, but also serves uh, customers uh, and those customers of customers. So let's go to the next slide, talk more about the state of the cyber market today. This is, a, this is really an attractive opportunity if we can get the, uh, the exposures priced properly. One of the changes and challenges that we've been seeing, uh, and this is impacting cyber insurers the world over, is how do I really understand uh, what my exposure is? And so in order to take advantage of, of what we see here in terms of really the, the amount of written premium that can be done well uh, and reducing uh, loss ratios and exposure, there's some things that we have to understand and, and sort of get our belt, uh, our belt around. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. You take a look here, uh, direct written premiums continue to rise uh, in the cyber industry. We don't see any meaningful change. And as a matter of fact, given some of the challenges that are occurring today, we think this trend is going to accelerate. Uh, next slide, please. If we look at some of the change in renewal premium rates, a lot of this is, is responding to some of the challenges around increasing losses. Uh, it's also responding to some of the uncertainties really about understanding uh, what's my risk here? Uh, next slide, please. We take a look here at just sort of the standalone cyber risk within the, the uh, liability market. Uh, loss ratios are accelerating uh, and they're growing. Uh, and it's unfortunate they're growing in the wrong direction. And so insurers are really looking to see how do we uh, respond? So what we're gonna do, uh, and this is where we at Connect IQ really focus in on what are core problems and core challenges and issues that impact uh, those who are negatively impact by uh, cyber risk. And so we're gonna unpack this and really start to look at root causes and what in fact can uh, cyber insurers do to change behavior for the better. And this is, this is for your insured base, but everyone else in the, in the coverage stack. All right, next slide. Let's take a look at the core problem and uh, it was, it was interesting and really helpful. Um, Leonardo talked uh, exquisitely about the issue around uh, phishing. And here's what we know. Uh, hackers or malevolent actors have been dealing with this issue successfully for, for the last few decades because they understand that at the end of the day, phishing is a tool, it's a great one, it works, they're successful. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's simply after credentials. And credentials, whether they be for uh, access into networks, access into devices, access to data repositories that have personal information uh, stored within, this is the gold mine. This is why, in part, we saw what happened with the solar winds attack uh, here in the US. And industry didn't really talk about what occurred. It came out four weeks later that how, uh, in this case, the Russians got in was they had a credential that allowed them to get in and do the initial intrusion. And this is the silent breach problem that, uh, if you go to the next slide, that we all are dealing with. And so ransomware gets deposited. But here's some things we know. 
studies have been done. Poneman has looked at these studies, the data breach report from uh, Verizon here in the US. 80% uh, of data breaches are silent because whoever that uh, unauthorized entity is, somehow they acquired valid credentials. Any network uh, administrator um, that is speaking honestly about this will admit you cannot stop a breach that if, they under, if the hacker understands what they're doing and they're getting increasingly sophisticated and that no longer can you rely on looking at IP addresses to try and determine if, if, if or not this is a, a, a good guy or a bad guy. What's happening here is the credentials allow you in and then the bulk of the industry has been focusing on how do we reduce dwell time? How do we mitigate once they're in the operating environment? And we at Connect IQ believe these 80% or four out of five can be stopped, but it's gonna require uh, a different way of looking at this. I've noticed in one of the chats, someone talked about, uh, it's been attributed to Einstein anyway, that if, if you're expecting different results, you have to do something different. And so here we look at dwell time, 287 days, it's increasing. Uh, again, depending on the area that you're in, costs continue to go up and these costs are increasingly being borne by insurers. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so th there are two principles here that, that we look at uh, as we think about zero trust. Uh, and these are core to creating an environment that mitigates and actually prevents the use of credentials. So the first principle or law is that no credential or cryptographic secret exists either before its function. How things work today, uh, particularly when you think about uh, cryptography, there's key exchange, keys are pulled back and forth from a key repository in some senses, but the fact that they exist outside their function, they are acquirable, and this continues to happen uh, inside organizations. The second law or principle is that when you're establishing a proxy for identity, and we all have it, it's, it's a credential, it's our password, uh, those types of things, and it may be something that a company will just ascribe a moniker or a name to. The problem is, if that exists again in violation of the first principle, you continue to run into this problem that credentials that exist outside of their small job is uh, in terms of time is, is a problem uh, because everything requires uh, trying to deal with what we like to call this the infinity problem. So essentially what happens today, you'll have um, your cryptographic key stored in a vault and then you have to lock the vault with something, you lock it with another key, what do you do with key two? Well, key two gets in vault two, secured by key three, you can see the problem. It's an infinity problem, you cannot solve it if you have credentials existing outside of their immediate function. So next slide, please. So what we at Connect to IQ have done is we've created this new approach that looks at and makes everything ephemeral. And so there's nothing for a hacker to grab. And key, uh, encryption keys are, are created in the only place in the universe that they need to be. And that is inside the actual device. And then they're gone. Uh, this is quite different than what happens today in, in uh, most people who do data protection. Those keys exist. They can be passed around. They can be acquired. Here, there's no way to do that. When we look at uh, ways to think about um, preventing, uh, and this is something that uh, the agencies here in the US have noticed that prevention has to rise to the top of the security stack. Today, prevention is basically given a pass and most organizations will focus on how do I now deal with the event? Well, again, we know 80% of all successful breaches happen because valid credentials. Those can be stopped. Now, the other 20%, it is true that they will get in, and they'll get in some other way, but these tend to be a, a bit more noisy in terms of incidents of compromise. And it's really interesting, Larry Poneman, um, he's uh, head of the, the uh, Poneman Institute, he's known globally as Mr. Trust. Uh, he noted that uh, Connect IQ's solution to dealing with these problems is, 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 is vital, it's important, and we've had, and I can't tell you who it is, but um, individual who works in deep cyber, uh, they work at the nation state level. They've looked at Connect IQ's approach to dealing with true ephemerality, and protecting environments, protecting data, protecting identities, identities, and they've noted that this is better than nation state level. Uh, and this includes all nation states, including the US. And so the question becomes, what are we going to do uh, as insurers as we think about really understanding the risk and the core risk? Everything starts with the beginning of the kill chain. 
do I have your credentials? As a, as a hacker, I want your credentials. And so even in a phishing environment, if, if, if the uh, script calls to call back to a command and control server and send back the malware, with Connect IQ's technology, that cannot happen because they're not in the zero trust environment. Next slide, please. All right, here's some considerations to think about if you're gonna realize some of these market opportunities uh, that exist for the cybersecurity market. Uh, challenge what are considered best practices. Uh, here's what we know. Billions have been spent globally on cybersecurity and best practices have not simply yielded the return that we thought we would find. And a, a couple of myths that we would like to bust here uh, and deal with are part of the cause. Myth one is determined hackers will always get in. In part, that's true, but it's too narrow um, or too broad an analysis. Four out of five breaches happen because of these credentials. Those can be stopped. Now, the other 20% or so, yes, they will get in and you do need to have robust tools to deal post-breach. Where Connect IQ focuses is on pre-breach. Let's reduce most of the cost in the system by not allowing uh, individuals and devices that are not part of a trust environment. Uh, the second myth is that MFA provides adequate additional protection. Well, again, not quite true. Now, MFA is good, but MFA, again, is subject to the same challenges that we noted in, in those two principles. And that's whether somebody is using traditional top T or whatever, it doesn't matter. Hackers are continuing to find ways to acquire those, those uh, credentials and tools. And so frictionless and machine to machine MFA, they do provide adequate uh, additional protection. As far as we know, Connect IQ is the only uh, company that actually provides that type of, of uh, MFA that does not require a human to do anything because as was said before, uh, brilliantly, that humans are a weak link. And so to the degree you can remove the human from the security process, that's better. Also uh, insurers, they look at what are some of the root causes of these, these initial intrusions? Because again, it keeps going back to this question of did they get credentials? We look at the recent Kaseya breach. We look at the colonial uh, pipeline breach. We look at the breach of the large um, uh, grocery provider um, in, in Northern Europe. Everything keeps pointing back to in large measure, someone had credentials that they should not have. Zero trust environments have to start at the beginning of what we like to call the kill chain and that is the use of those credentials. Those can be stopped even though a lot of technologies today focus on after the breach. Connect IQ, we focus on stopping the breach truly, uh, as opposed to saying we stop the breach after the breach has already happened. And you're trying to limit or mitigate uh, damage at that point. Um, reassess risk, risk selection and underwriter, uh, underwriting criteria. Insurers are very good at this. Next slide, please. This is what you do every single day. Our position is really understand what the exposure here. You can use pricing, coverage op options. These are things you do today and we know they work. Uh, but really assure also that all participants in, in the coverage tower that they're aware, because one of the things we often see when you get into reinsurers, they don't necessarily have a good shared understanding of what that cyber exposure happens to be. So it's vital that um, whoever is in your coverage tower is aware of that as well. And really be careful of falling into sort of the simple best practices adoption. Um, they're often outdated, uh, they're ineffective, but we keep using them because we presume that best practices result in um, sort of best return and best solutions when in fact, in many cases they don't. And so challenging orthodoxy, challenge infrastructure and really go at what is the heart of the, the challenge with cybersecurity. And what we at Connect IQ do, we're US-based, we also have an office in Luxembourg, is we focus on root cause. And for this reason, we, do a, uh, we actually are protecting the most sensitive of the most sensitive of information, data, devices, access to networks. And we do that simply by focusing on what happens at the beginning. What happens at the beginning is the favorite tool of, of hackers and malevolent actors and particularly nation state actors. And that is, I'm after your credentials. I get your credentials, I get into your environment, you don't know. Now you have to try and recognize that I'm there. And so we see a balanced approach 
of dealing with a threat before it occurs, stopping the vast majority of them because they get in with credentials, and then really taking constrained resources and focusing how do we deal with that 20% that will get in uh, some other way. But the good news here is those other ways tend to be a bit noisy. And so it's about stopping that silent breach. Next slide, please. And so as, as we begin to think about uh, so what's next in the um, cyber uh, industry as it relates to cyber insurance, if really focusing on what is causing the beginning of the threat chain and stopping that at the gate. And at Connect IQ, this is what we specialize in. Uh, and we partner with a lot of other organizations that if a breach does happen, we do the handoff and they will deal with the mitigation. But if it's based on a credential, those can be stopped contrary to what uh, we typically hear around cybersecurity circles. Uh, thank you again, everyone, uh, for the opportunity to share a little bit about Connect IQ and, and our thoughts around cybersecurity, uh, and particularly as it relates to uh, the ins cyber insurance industry. Uh, the opportunity is great. There's opportunity for lots and lots of profitable written premium, but that's only if we get it right in terms of really understanding the risk exposure and taking the necessary uh, steps, be they legal or technical controls to assure that uh, bad actors are stopped at the start. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ken, for the brilliant presentation, as the ones of the other speakers, of course. What we really care about here that you bring, you, that you bring home with you is the fact that, uh, um, well, by contacting us and, uh, and reaching out to the, to the Cybersecurity Partnership Program, you're gonna have, well, this was just a, a, a non-exhaustive selection of all the uh, services that we have and all the different approaches we have to fix one of the uh, gravest uh, uh, industries issue at the moment, that is data breach. Um, so, yeah. With these uh, closing remarks, I uh, would pass the, uh, the floor to Andrea for, uh, at, at, uh, right now I believe we have time for just one of the questions we collected uh, uh, in these last days. Um, Andrea? Thank you, thank you, Daniel, and thank you all actually for being here, for presenting your outstanding expertise to our, uh, to our audience. Actually, there is uh, something in between a question and a comment from uh, from Alan uh, in the in the Q and A session in um, part of the uh, or function. Um, in fact, actually says and suggests that cyber cyber insurers should embrace uh, Connect IQ approach to the zero trust by incentivizing clients to use this technology in order to reduce premiums. Actually, if I can comment on these, uh, uh, I believe, Ken, you're very happy to, 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 to hear or to read um, the point from Alan. Uh, this is one of the reasons, actually, we have organized this webinar. Um, as Daniel mentioned, um, we want to present to you uh, just a little bit of the kind of expertise that privacy rules, cyber security members can offer, uh, not only to cyber insurers, but also to their clients. The kind of partnership we are proposing to you insurers out there is indeed uh, just to sit with us, uh, learn about the kind of services that our members can offer to you, um, allow us to tailor make a proposal for you and possibly for your clients um, in order to understand actually if you can reduce premiums, um, but also re reduce the risks that uh, not only your insurance company, but also the, the, the companies that you insure are exposed to. Um, and the reason why for us is particularly important that uh, Lindsay is here, um, because as she explained also her, uh, as like as all our uh, legal members have extraordinary expertise in dealing with problems of the insurance sector when related to data, uh, data breaches and so on and so forth. Um, privacy rules is available to you and actually our experts are available to you to address problems also when, uh, not only when problems arise, and so in the event of a data breach in the operations room where you have to coordinate a lot of different kinds of expertise, but um, in the preventive phase, which is what uh, many of our panelists uh, discussed about um, today. Um, I, I see that actually time, time went by, um, but possibly, uh, Lindsay, I can see you, I don't know if uh, in, in a second you, you, you would be available to share uh, with the audience the expertise and the experiences, sorry, of a lawyer 
um, that has been in the operations room of a data breach with insurance and with cybersecurity experts. So what's the advantage that you see in being all interconnected and having uh, preset procedures to address a data breach problem, uh, minimizing the costs at various levels that insurers have to pay for, and also, of course, reputational damages that arise from a data breach. Sure, absolutely. What I would say is that one of the best ways to mitigate risks and reduce costs is to have effective communication and collaboration, because uh, part of the um, uh, post-breach experience, having seen it uh, work effectively and, and not so effectively, is the speed with which the company can react and the accuracy with which it can communicate information to the public. And when the company is slow to respond or doesn't have legal speaking with technology, speaking with PR, um, what you get is a presentation to the public and to your customers and to affected individuals, as well as to regulators, that looks like the company wasn't properly um, prepared to respond to these types of events. Uh, cyber incidents are now quite common. And so it's not a good look for a company to show that it hasn't prepared in advance. And often you'll see in particular, sometimes a company coming out with um, information that turns out to not be accurate in terms of what happened, how many people were impacted and that sort of thing. So that's why when you have legal designing the communications, but they're not in communication with the technology experts, you can get the wrong message. And then similarly, sometimes the, the tone of the message is wrong. If you have you know, lawyers drafting to reduce legal risk, um, but not taking into account the reputational impact and the customer relations, which is such a critical uh, perspective offered by PR. So, Having all three tiers and all three perspectives uh, working together for a for a very uh, coordinated and fast response to a breach really does help a company to reduce um, the range of risks that have been spoken about today. Excellent, excellent. Lindsay, thank you very much. Actually, this gives me the opportunity to mention that uh, thanks to the activity of the committee that you chair within Privacy Rules, we are going to organize another webinar where we will present our uh, global data breach prevention and response mechanisms uh, that lies, as you mentioned, on these three pillars. And it's also true and fair to remember that Macmillan, um, being so sensitive, sensitive and uh, experienced in, um, in your practice, the practice that you chair, has also a communication uh, team uh, that can help companies in Canada in particular in order to mitigate damages and prevent damages from a reputational perspective also, uh, the Vantage Group within Macmillan. Um, having said this, um, I would like to uh, make a lot of questions actually uh, that we also collected in these days, but time um, is running far beyond the one hour we allocated for this, uh, for this webinar. So I thank very much everyone in the audience. I uh, warmly invite you all to contact us for further information. We will distribute to you all um, documents that we have created and actually Daniel, I pray you to upload them here now, um, uh, the two documents, one for insurance companies and one um, presenting the cybersecurity partnership program for, for you all to take um, away. And, um, and we hope to see you again uh, in the near future. Thank you very much once more uh, to everyone and especially to our distinguished speakers that came today. Thank you. And thank you, Daniel, for organizing all this. No problem. Thanks to you, Andrea, and uh, to all our panelists, of course. Uh, looking forward to continue this work. And uh, great. Uh, stay tuned and uh, see you at the new uh, Privacy Rules event.